us this morning and welcome to our presentation. Um, so we'll be talking about a grant that we have helped run and organize at GW for the past two years, which encourages the adoption or adaption and creation of open educational resources. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Doherty. I'm a research services librarian at GW, and I was a coordinator in year two. Hi, everyone. I'm Shira Eller. I'm the art and design librarian at GW Libraries and Academic Innovation, um, and I played a few roles in the uh, grant process. I was on the selection committee. I was a kickoff presenter and a librarian partner in year one and two. And I'm Bridget Kamsler. I'm the University Archivist at GW. Um, I've been a coordinator for both years and a kickoff presenter um, in year one, and we will explain what those roles mean shortly. Um, we are part of Libraries and Academic Innovation at GW, so you might hear us say LAI. Um, that's what that means. And if you think of questions, we'll take them at the end, but you can also put them in the chat as you think of them. Um, and again, we'll take them at the end. Um, thank you, Bridget. Um, thank you to everyone who is attending. Um, right now, I'm going to speak about the response to rising textbook costs and GW's activity in that. Next slide, please. So textbooks are expensive. According to a national association, according to the National Association of College Store Stores, a student spends on average $339 on textbooks per semester. And according to a 2016 to 2017 affordability report conducted by the GW Student Association, on average, a GW student can spend over $300 on textbooks. The exorbitant amount of textbook costs have increased since 2011, as you can see from this chart, very steep incline, and they have continued to increase since 2021 according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. Thank you. The price of textbooks has a real impact on students' life and disproportionately affects low-income students. These images are from GW's Textbook Broke campaign in 2019. As you can see, one student states that the cost of textbooks have cost them a trip home, and another one cites groceries. But of course, these aren't the only ramifications of high textbook costs. Students have also indicated that they have registered for less classes because of textbook costs, gotten lower grades because they just, they didn't buy the textbook because they couldn't afford it. And they have also withdrew or dropped a class because they didn't have a textbook. All of the responses undermine student, student learning and demand a response. Next text, please. Or next slide, sorry. <laughs> so one response to rising textbook costs by faculty and librarians has been the adoption of open educational resources or OERs. OERs are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution um, by others or limited or, or with a by others with no or limited restrictions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> LAI is and has been dedicated to promoting and supporting the adoption of OERs and no cost to student materials into GW courses. Some initiatives are less formal, such as LAI employees speaking to professors and advocating for OERs. Um, <clears throat> this can range from working with a professor to create an OER in depth task and all that that entails to just talking to a professor and encouraging them to use no cost student resources that are available through the library. Uh, we also have the Top Textbooks program, which acquires up to three copies of required textbooks for a group of undergraduate high enrollment courses with traditionally exp expensive textbooks and makes them to available to students via the library. We also participate in the WRLC Affordability Working Group by way of our colleague, Misty Trinnell. 
And we also have the Adapting Course Materials for Equity grant, more commonly referred to as ACME grant, which uh, we are here to talk to you about today, and Bridget will do so. All right, thank you. So the general landscape of um, things with OER and the cost of things plus the previous projects at GW led to the Adapting Course Materials for Equity faculty grant. A uh, previous GW Libraries colleague had been working on this since the fall of 2021, and that librarian worked with the Dean and the Associate Dean and one of the Directors of Research Services, Morgan Stoddard, to launch the program. All of these individuals did have great relationships with the faculty um, and knew that there might have been an interest in this. Um, so the first year, ACME received a budget of $5,000. And the funding model is based on models of similar programs at other universities, with particular thanks to the Virtual Library of Virginia and the Northwestern University. The parameters of the grant were um, some goals were to improve equitable access to affordable materials for GW students, uh, encourage and support adoption of no, no cost course materials as replacements for required commercial textbooks in order to save students money, and the program would award faculty stipends between $250 to $1,000. The eligibility criteria um, was that faculty had to be full and part-time GW faculty with continuing appointments in the 2022-2023 academic year, and only undergraduate level courses were eligible to submit applications for this first year. The areas that could be applied were to adopt. Uh, the proposals to adopt would involve replacing required commercial textbooks or course materials with OERs or zero cost course materials. And proposals to adopt involved little or no work to edit existing materials. And those awards could be up to $500. Or adapt and create. Proposals to adapt and create would involve adapting existing OERs or creating new open educational resources in order to replace the required commercial textbooks and course materials. And those would be up to $1,000 for the award. The grant recipients would also receive guidance from LAI staff, um, including training sessions and having a dedicated partner um, or other people to help guide the project. It was at this time that I came on board as a grant coordinator, and so that meant keeping track of all the paperwork, moving things forward, hitting deadlines, helping to lead meetings, creating our templates, and more. The coordinators are not the ones who make the final choice for who is funded. That is a separate selection committee that the coordinators put together, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So after everything was set up and the different areas of the award um, were figured out, um, we started advertising. And so apart from the website, we shared it on social media, in newsletters, and in university-wide emails. Three informational webinars were held for GW faculty interested in a general introdu introduction to the application process and also to offer a Q&A. Our dean was interviewed by the student newspaper, The Hatchet. Librarians were also asked to share information with the GW networks that they might have had. Flyers were posted. We asked department administrators to share information within their departments. And various GW offices were also asked to share. So basically, anyone we could find to get the word out, we you know, tried to get them um, advertising this uh, grant. We used a Google form for the application and had it on the ACME website with a due date for when the materials needed to be sent in. In terms of what was on the application, it was began typically with name, email address, school department, their title, um, and their status at the university. And then we asked specifics about the course they planned to incorporate the OER materials in, if it was new or existing course, and the expected enrollment from zero to 150 plus, um, when the court course would be taught, and we also asked for a copy of the syllabus. Then the next portion of the application required a description of the project. So what type of grant were they applying, adopt or the adapt create? What was the desired amount of funding? a description of the project and their timeline for when they thought they would be able to finish and incorporate this new um, item into their class, how the project would promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in teaching and learning, uh, potential financial savings to the students, and how this would positively impact the students in the course, in addition to reducing the cost of their course materials, and how they would assess the impact of this project on student learning. 
and also if they could think about what support they might need from LAI. So in addition to those grant requirements, um, we uh, included some other things just so people knew what would be expected of them um, if they were to receive the grant. So they must use the OER that they were thinking about making or um, adopting during the fall 2023 to fall 2024 year. Um, that it would, if they were making something, it would have to be openly licensed and put into an OER repository or our institutional repository. Um, that it must meet accessibility guidelines, um, that they must meet with some partners and attend meetings and that kind of thing, just so they knew, um, you know, once if they would receive the grant, what would be expected of them. So potential applications, uh, applicants had about a month to apply once everything went on the website and once we started advertising. So during this time, the coordinators put together the selection committee that I had mentioned. We did discuss if the coordinators wanted to be the ones making the decision um, for who would be receiving the amount of money and for how much, but we decided to keep our work separate since we already had so much to do just with the administration of the grant and we were so embedded in the process, we thought bringing in outside people would make sense um, and kind of have a fresh take on what the applications were including. For the selection committee, we hoped for a wide array of people from LAI and also thought a student perspective and a faculty member would be a good idea to include. And you can see the people's names and their titles um, along the right. So ultimately, the selection committee consisted of two librarians, a GW student, a faculty member, an educational developer, course reserves and resource sharing specialist and the director of instructional design. We didn't really have any idea if anyone would apply, um, but we did receive eight applications. After the application date closed, we um, the coordinators put together the folders of the individual applications, which would be reviewed by the selection committee. And so at this point, we knew what people were at least applying for. Um, so we started to think through potential library partnerships because we wanted to see if LAI had the capacity, software and knowledge to support the proposals. The selectors would use a rubric to grade the applications. The coordinators created the rubric, hoping it would allow people to judge the applications in an equal way. And we matched the areas of grading to what they had applied. So um, in particular, we wanted to have um, an area of description of the project and the goals, um, amount of student savings and the impact, diversity, equity, inclusion in teaching and learning materials, the timeline and how their assessment plan was. So there was a point system that went along with each row. And at the end of the rubric, we asked the selector if the person should get an award and how much money they thought the faculty should be awarded for the project. We asked the selection committee to fill out a Google form with the name of the applicant and their score, if the project should be funded and for what amount. We also asked the selectors to upload copies, either scans or Word docs to a folder of their rubrics um, for the coordinators. We thought it would be beneficial for our own learning to see how people use the rubric and if um, they had any additional comments or things that we could use um, for the following year. Um, but the actual grades and who was making um, any notes that they were putting on, all of that was um, confidential. The coordinators gathered all the information and created a spreadsheet with this anonymized information. And then we then brought the selection committee back together to discuss the applications and decide on the amounts to award. The coordinators did attend that selection committee final meeting um, just to kind of move things forward. But again, it was really the selection committee that was making the final call. The discussion was interesting because we all realized that the categories of adopt versus and create versus Adapt, adapt, create versus adopt could apply in a number of different ways or happen simultaneously. Um, we did think originally that it would fall easily into one category or another, but it was more nuanced than that. And that really came out during the discussions. And the selection committee wanted to fund as many as possible, that, which meant that while all faculty pretty much asked for the max funding allowed for their category, it didn't necessarily turn out that way. And as a reminder, the grants were in the amount of 250 to 1,000 with adopt a max of 500 and the adapt create a max of 1,000. Ultimately, what this is really about is incentivizing the faculty to use open materials in their classes for the benefit of their students. And we hoped that would shine through rather than the actual amount of money they might have been receiving. 
So almost simultaneously to this, the coordinators were also working on creating other paperwork that was required. The award letters were to come from our dean, so we needed to create the template for the successful and unsuccessful applications. And we worked with our copyright and compliance officer and our office of general counsel to create a memorandum of understanding that the faculty would sign. Uh, they had previously agreed to the stipulations when they applied, but we wanted to hone in on those things with an official MOU. But ultimately, the MOU that they signed was pretty simple. It's two pages. So one thing to keep in mind here, um, if you're thinking about doing a project like this, is the reliance on third parties. It wasn't just ourselves, but many others that were involved um, and everyone's schedules and things like that needed to be considered. Coming back to the librarian partnerships, the coordinators knew um, who would be receiving the awards and their specific project proposals. So we can now reach out to those potential partners or their supervisors to get a feel for their interest and availability. And the library partner is there again to give the faculty guidance throughout the project, but not have all the expertise um, in the project that itself. Um, they could have the expertise, but it wasn't necessary. The library partner was mainly um, needed to know how, um, how to move forward with the project, stay on track with their goals, um, and be able to be a conduit if there are questions. And Shira will describe this more in depth with some year one case studies in a little bit. So at this point, the selectors had chosen the faculty to get the awards and the amount they should be awarded. The coordinators had created the paperwork and the faculty were going to be told by our Dean with an official letter and the RMOU that they had to sign and send back within a week. And you may be asking what happens if someone said no to an award. Um, well, this did actually happen because the proposed project was not able to start because the faculty member ended up not teaching it for the upcoming school year. So they very nicely rejected the award. And so we had to figure out how to reallocate those funds. Um, what we decided, what the coordinators decided to do was go back to the selection committee and describe the situation. And they decided to add more funds to one person's award. Um, and they just signed an updated MOU. The coordinators then started to plan what we were calling a kickoff meeting, and this was mainly designed for the faculty recipients to get an overview of things that might apply to their projects. We designed it to be a half day workshop that was required as part of their MOU to attend. We also wanted to give faculty an opportunity to meet their library partners, which was also required as part of the MOU. And we surveyed the faculty and the library partners to get an understanding of their availability for this kickoff. The coordinators wanted to start um, with, a kick, with a success story, and so we invited a faculty member from American University, Dr. Meg Bentley, to speak. Dr. Bentley had received a similar grant to create an open lab net notebook in their biology department, and so this was an inspiring way to start and got everyone excited to get to work. After that, we had two instructional designers from LAI do a presentation on course design and digital accessibility. And after a break, the scholarly communications team at LAI presented on licensing, permissions, and copyright for open educational resources. The final portion of this half-day workshop was devoted to the partnerships, and we placed the library partner and the faculty member into a breakout room in Zoom to start planning and asking questions and getting to know each other. The MOU did require that this, a group meet before August, so this satisfied that, but it also seemed to work well um, with what the faculty had just learned throughout the workshop. And then we all came back together to close out the day for a couple minutes at the end. We have recorded this entire workshop and we've shared it with everyone as well as each of the presenters slides. And since all of the faculty had either attended the workshop or watched the recording, we worked with our financial operations team to get the faculty members paid. And the stipends were added to their monthly paychecks. And this is again, another reliance on um, outside party. Now the real work of the partnerships could begin and the coordinators were able to take a bit of a break since it was all about the faculty working on their proposed projects. We checked in with the library partners later in the summer and had a virtual meeting with just the library partners to chat and see how things were going. I think this was refreshing to hear from each other and kind of gather the library partners back together um, since some of the faculty hadn't really started or things were starting um, they were taking care of other things before working on their project and they didn't really plan to get things going until closer to the fall semester. So I think it was a good way to bring us back together and check in and understand that we were all experiencing this together with this new OER venture. So there was certainly a bit of learning and trial and error along the way, um, but with good intentions in the end. 
So knowing when the faculty were supposed to finish their projects, with which most of them finished at the end of the fall semester, the coordinators ramped a bit back up to start gathering the final reports from the faculty. We created a Google Doc with various questions that each faculty member filled out, thinking about you know, how they um, thought the project went, things that they learned, how they used um, the material that they incorporated or created. And we used that information from the final report to populate the website. And I'm on the scholarly communications team as well, and so we gathered what we could for the work products with specific links, which, again, that had been part of the original um, MOU and uh, MOU that they would make the material available. Um, so what you're seeing on this slide is from the website portion we call the project showcase. We worked with the library web developer or designer on this, and we also listed outcomes and acknowledged the library partner. So um, throughout the year, it has been a lot of work. And so what really helped was a monday.com board with project management to keep track of everything and having many examples of all the work um, that we were doing. And we also took a ton of notes. Um, so this is one screenshot um, and you can see we've added links and things. Um, and so these would become our templates. So I will now hand it back to Sheila who will describe year two. Sorry about that, I lost my cursor. <laughs> so hi everyone, I'm gonna to talk to you about a few changes that happened in year two, which is when I joined. Um, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Bridget. Thank you. Um, so let's see, one of the first major changes that happened was we switched coordinators. Um, so Bridget stepped into the lead coordinator role and my colleague, Maddie Kadish, and I joined the team. Being new to this type of work and also new to the organization, I was really, really thankful for the diligent documentation done by the previous coordinators in particular, because when thinking about joining the team, I had to weigh that against also acclimating to my new position. So having the visual of the Monday board actually gave me a better understanding of what work would be required of me. And thus I was able to uh, weigh whether I had the capacity to join the project, which I'm happy that I did. Um, I was also thankful <laughs> for their creation and curation of email templates, which obviously helped expedite the work. Next slide, please. Um, in line with their foresight to keep extremely detailed documentation and templates, the first year coordinators also had the foresight to keep um, a a list of lessons learned, as well as a running list of matters to discuss at a more fitting time. And also they had the foresight to ask the selection committee for feedback, which allowed us to consider points to be improved in the rubric and the process for next year. Um, so the matters to discuss at future meetings or things to discuss at future meetings is living documents. I can't really speak to what changes came from it. Um, as topics are added, discussed, and removed. Um, but just to give a general sense of the type of subjects that are added there, it currently has, a, like among other things, a note about the rubric, a note about the pay payment process, and a note about updating the website. All things we wanna discuss for next year to keep progressing the project, and some things that are just more appropriately done a little bit down the road. Um, also, as Bridget mentioned, um, the last year coordinators gathered feedback from the selection committee about the selection process. Uh, it was just done on a Google form and the selection committees were asked um, multiple choice questions, or I guess um, scale questions, and as well as open-ended questions. Um, the questions were kind of like how they felt about the discussions in the final meeting, the overall performance of the committee, and of course, about the rubric. Uh, the feedback from that survey was then added on to our lessons learned document, which we consulted throughout the year to build on and improve um, this year this year's grant. Um, <clears throat> I consulted the document and the selection committee's feedback um, listed on it as I updated the rubric. Next slide, please. please. Okay, so I used that feedback and consulted with my co-coordinators and reviewed the grants grant programs rubric when I updated the rubric for year two. 
Um, we updated the rubric after the application period opened. So <laughs> we made sure not to change anything that would divert too drastically from the website and the application. So everyone would still have a fair shot and there wouldn't be like a kind of a hidden rubric that they weren't aware of. And we made simple changes. We split the category of description of project and project roles just for clarity. Uh, we updated the wording of student savings category to ensure that the project wouldn't be penalized for the professor having already built savings into their course. We also updated the language of a, of a category to explicitly state accessibility so that it would, it would be even more on the selection committee's radar. <clears throat> and in consulting other rubrics, I saw a few things that I thought would be good to consider for next year, but once again, too drastic to do in the middle of the cycle. So in the spirit of detailed documentation and looking forward, I appended my thoughts to the, to the for future meeting list. Next slide, please. Um, so the process for selecting judges built on the last year in that we asked past judges to serve us to serve again, and we're delighted when they all agreed. We also had some new judges on the panel, which was great because we, it added some fresh perspectives. Uh, we were happy to welcome back the faculty member and welcome back another student. We felt that having their perspectives was crucial in the assessment process. <clears throat> Um, I would say one major benefit to having the past judges back was that they understood the process, so they were able to help the new judges or new selectors or judges a little bit more. Um, and another thing that changed in the selection process was that the selection committee was given more time to evaluate the applications. The review period was extended from a little over two weeks to a little over three weeks which was great considering that we received nearly double <laughs> the amount of the applications that we received last year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the major changes that happened and why we might have received double other than just people becoming more interested and more aware of our RERs <clears throat> was that we expanded the program to accept applications from graduate courses, including law and medicine. Advertising the application nearly remained the same aside from just we tweaked a little bit where we messaged former applicants and recipients and encouraged them to reapply or apply with a different project um, just to really spread the word. Uh, when we went to uh, expand it to all of GW, we first went to see if it was practical and possible. So we first reached out to financial, our financial operations department to ensure that it was indeed possible that we could pay the recipients, should they be from the law or the medical school. And then once we had confirmation on that, we considered that a more specialized project might need more specialized support naturally. So we reached out to uh, Jacob Burns Law Library, which is GW's law library. Um, to ensure that they would have the capacity to support a law project should it be selected. <clears throat> and we had a we had um, a relationship with the Himmelfarb Library, which is our health science library from the previous year. So we knew that they had they would have the capacity to support projects from the medical school. Um, as I stated and kind of ran over, but the <laughs> number of applications nearly doubled. <laughs> And five of those were from graduate level faculty. Overall, we rece received 15 applications and the selection committee chose eight projects. We then used the previous workflow, previous year's workflow, um, which Bridget spoke about uh, to advise the next steps and really just, it, it was pretty streamlined, but once again, dealing with third, party, third parties, you do have to kind of build that time in. <clears throat> and, just recently, we had the kickoff meeting for the recipients and we welcomed as our speaker for this um, kickoff meeting, we had a former recipient speak, which was really great because they had a more, um, I guess, uh, personal experience with the project. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. 
Uh, so we're already discussing some updates for the coming year. Uh, a major one is that we have requested more funds. So stay posted <laughs> or stay tuned rather. That's the phrase. Uh, <laughs> We have also, as I mentioned, kept a list of things to discuss at future meetings, which we, we will be consulting. Um, we might be changing the rubric a little bit, maybe changing the description of purpose on the, of the grant application. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, and we will also be considering, or we will also be, again, asking for feedback from the various parties involved. So depending on what they have to say, there might be more changes. Um, I can't speak to how the projects this year went yet, uh, but we do have some case studies from the first year, which Cheryl will be speaking with you about now. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'll be discussing some case studies from year one, including one that I was the library partner for. So next slide, please. Um, so as part of the application, um, we had asked if faculty um, needed support from LAI, and that would not be affecting um, whether they were selected or not. Um, so those um, included, like, did they need help finding OERs, finding materials through the library, copyright and licensing, help with digital accessibility, um, hosting support, aligning course materials with learning goals and objectives. Um, and based on what they said and the sort of subject matter as, um, of their course as well, they were paired um, with librarians and instructional designers in LAI. Next slide, please. Um, so one uh, really great uh, project that came out of year one was a um, website called um, Screening Shakespeare. Um, and it was a website of learning modules to introduce key concepts of film studies within the concept of film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. So the faculty member actually worked with two LAI instructional designers on things such as design principles, accessibility, um, creating alt text and image licensing. Um, and so this was a quite high time, uh, time commitment for LAI. Um, this faculty member actually used the funds to hire a coder so that she was actually able to make uh, quite a sophisticated website. Um, and then in terms of the sort of uh, assessment and sharing, she performed student surveys, um, did some presentations on uh, her project and created a blog post. Next slide, please. Um, another uh, really interesting project um, was a math project uh, that actually the faculty member had already adopted an OER pre-calculus book, um, but she found that the problem sets were insufficient. Um, and this was a class that was really meant to benefit students with weaker high school back math backgrounds. So she really needed the problem sets to um, go along with the sort of learning that they needed to do at each stage. So she wanted to create those problem sets um, to go along with the OER that she had already been using. Um, she was paired with a science and engineering librarian at LAI, Debbie Bizanson. Um, and this was a medium to high time commitment for the librarian. Um, the faculty member needed help with um, some of the challenges of transcribing equations, um, inconsistency in notation when remixing um, equations from open sources and researching an open publishing platform. Um, although the project was only sort of partially done, um, she was able to use it during the semester and students did prefer the faculty created materials over other textbooks. And because she's really committed to this project, um, although it was very time consuming, it's in progress and she will actually participate again in year two. Next slide, please. Um, so this case study, this last one was the one that I was the faculty, uh, the librarian partner um, for. This was a music theory course um, where the faculty member wanted to move from a traditional textbook to an open textbook that already existed, plus adding some additional like audio and, and uh, material that he produced himself. Um, 
I found that it was a pretty low time commitment for me. Um, we talked a little bit about platform structure and copyright questions. Um, he settled on Blackboard for delivery, which was great for um, his students. Of course, it wasn't open to non-GW users, um, but it still was like within the parameters of the grant. Um, and also is added, able to add non-Western music theory concepts, which was going along with sort of the idea of um, diversifying material as well as just making it no cost. Um, and he plans to continue to work on this and present at a music pedagogy uh, conference on using open materials. Next slide, please. So we got some really great feedback from faculty that had to do with um, really the grant um, boosting morale. So and and promoting like giving them the final push to move to an open source textbook. Uh, or open access textbook. So um, one faculty member said, as a longtime temporary part-time faculty member, I don't have many opportunities to re receive funding for my ideas. So I thought that was great feedback. And then the other uh, faculty member said, this program gives me the final push I needed. So um, this was really positive feedback, we thought. Next slide, please. So just quickly, some lessons learned. Um, so students saved money, um, course content was diversified and tailored to courses, um, faculty were motivated to convert courses to OER or zero cost materials, faculty who received grants became OER advocates in their departments and uh, sort of in the wider uh, subject area that they're in. Um, it created and broadened relationships between LAI and faculty within LAI and with our law and medical schools, and of course, an opportunity for new staff to build relationships and learn project management skills. Some of the challenges, of course, um, were the large time commitment um, and, of, and the sort of unknown uh, commitment of time at the outset of the partnerships. Um, logistics, especially dealing with third parties and the grant payout, coordinating schedules, et cetera. Um, one sort of thing where it felt like maybe we needed more expertise um, was like what the different platforms available are for OERs and maybe like what the costs and it, uh, benefits and challenges to those platforms were. Um, Although we did have people use like Blackboard or institutional repository um, or like WordPress or their own um, website. And then lastly, we wish we had more money to give out, but um, everyone wants more money for every project that they do. So, um, but we hope we'll get more next year. Um, next slide, please. So do you have any questions? And I, I guess we can uh, stop sharing and see if anyone, um, has a question. We have five or six minutes left. Um, so you can put a question in the chat. You can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. Um, and we will have questions, take your questions, or you can email us later if you think of something at that time. Kelly. Oh, yeah, I actually have a question. Um, I was just curious, and apologies if you mentioned this already, but where the funding came from? Was it exclusively from the library um, or from another organization? Or would you look to like maybe including other departments and funding in the future? That's a good idea. So it did come from the library budget only. Um, so we did not get like apply for any sort of like outside grants from like a grant granting organization or um no the departments didn't like kick in for this it's possible that departments are uh giving their faculty encouragement to do this through grants but we don't know about it if they are so this was all from the library budget LAI budget.
Any other questions? Uh, one thing I can add in, uh, this is Joel at WRLC, is that uh, WRLC, as of this past year, um, actually there was a presentation about it yesterday, uh, we have set up a very similar grant program that's available to everyone in the WRLC. So if you're interested in pursuing something like this, but um, you necessarily don't have the funding available, which is pretty common these days, um, Feel free to reach out to anyone on the uh, textbook affordability working group. Um, our information's on the library internet, and you've probably seen our name mentioned a few times in the newsletters sent out. Um, but if you're interested in pursuing something like this for your faculty, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're looking for people to partner with right now. Um, as of right now, we have, I think it's a $250,000 grant. Um, so we're able to afford quite a few people under our umbrella. Um, and this is very much building off of the program that GW did. I'm definitely not taking anything away from your presentation. It was great. Um, but yes, if you're interested, uh, reach out to us and we'll be happy to work with you and move forward. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we've had a couple faculty who have reached out, you know, and they want to do OERs or get some funding and we're like, we're already on year two, we're closed. So, you know, the more the merrier and more, um, you know, opportunities, obviously, but then, you know, year three, we hope they apply. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. Um, and I did put the link to the website for the ACME grant in the um, chat if anyone wants to look at it on their own time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>